I want to take a moment to thank our AV team back there that just silently just hang out back there doing all this amazing things to put the presentations up, put the music up, um, and do the volumes up and down, and just praise God for Brett and Alan back there. Um, I, so, yeah, everybody want to say praise God for Brett and Alan? Amen. Amen. All right. Well, this Sabbath, I was praying, and I was, we we're doing this series on uh, Revelation uh, 13 and 14 and three angel messages and all this stuff, but God put thanksgiving on my heart because, I don't know, last Thursday was Thanksgiving, and I was just praying about that, and I was like, wow, it just seems like we need to talk about thanksgiving. And uh, so... How many of you are thankful to God for something, anything? Amen. Well, this week, I uh, just had, um, I was listening to the radio, Christian radio, and I heard a lady, she's got a program called In the Marketplace, or In the Market, with Janet Parshall. I don't know if anybody heard of that, but she's a Christian uh, lady and just has a lot of people she interviews all the time. And boy, she was interviewing this guy. And all of a sudden, I'm like, I know that guy. His name's Louis Giglio. Anybody heard of him? Louis Giglio? And uh, so just for Sabbath school, I just... Uh, <laughs> The girl cracked me up because we were talking about his last name too and in Sabbath school over there and, and uh, I was telling them about him and, and we watched a little video about him called uh, How Great Is Our God? And within that little video, and if you haven't watched that, I encourage you to watch that, How Great Is Our God by Louis Giglio. And uh, in there he talks about in comparison to the universe and just four planets basically, um, what's the lar what was the largest planet, Mufisi or something, star? Um, something, the big dog star he called it, by, but it was something Mufisi, or Musifi, and huge star, and he correlates it to if our Earth was a golf ball, here's how big these stars, these four stars would be. And the star that's in our galaxy is the sun. And comparing the golf ball to us, the, the sun would be 16 feet across. And if you put 16 feet up here, and then you held the golf ball to that humongous ball, 16 feet in diameter, that's our earth. And that's just our sun. What? And then he's, how, well, he's got to memorize, memorize this. He's got all these numbers in his head. He tells about how many golf balls of earth could fit in our sun. And it's a lot of golf balls. And then he goes in to talk about the next largest one and the, the, uh, another one. And then that Musifi or whatever. And uh, Candice Musifi or something. And it makes all these other ones look tiny. And yet, our earth looked tiny compared to the sun. And then here we are on this earth. Wow. And the creator of the universe designed each and every one of us to the cellular level and created your DNA and made you super, super special. Why? It's for a purpose. It's to glorify him. That is why we are created and exist. It's super cool. Super cool. So Janet Parshall was interviewing Louis Giglio, and we're going to talk about that in just a little bit, but um, uh, he's got a new book, and we're going to talk about that. So uh, it was really neat, and it all tied into, and it was all surrounded, his whole message of, in this book is from one verse of the only six verses in Psalms 23. So I thought we'd take a little journey 
through Psalms 23. And it's a pretty familiar um, uh, psalm. So let's see if we can find some reasons to be thankful today from Psalms 23. And if you want, you can open up your Bibles, check this out. Um, uh, Verse 1 says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Hmm. How many of you woke up this morning, and instead of just a normal yawn, you went, bah. I don't hear anybody. <laughs> Have you ever felt like a sheep? I haven't. I, I don't think I've ever felt like a sheep. I just, I've never correlated myself to a sheep. I mean, I just, I don't know, it's a lion or something. And, uh, but a sheep is just, and sheep just, I don't know, they probably really smart. And I think somebody, maybe, I don't know, somebody's told me about sheep, and maybe they're smart. I haven't researched that. But boy, I tell you, they just don't seem so smart a lot of times, and they just wander around, and they need lead a lot. Have you ever felt in life like you're wandering? You ever felt like you're wandering kind of aimlessly? ever felt like you wondering what is my purpose in life why do I exist is there a bigger purpose than just doing what I'm doing right now boy I think about these things actually a lot and I challenge myself a lot with these things and but the Lord is my shepherd I shall not want you know that just made me think of this, this whole thing about the Ten Commandments, right? So if the Lord is my shepherd, then I'm submitting my life to him. I'm asking him to actually lead me. Versus letting other people lead me. Letting other things lead me. Are there other things trying to lead us right now? in this world? Boy, I tell you, I, I don't have too many things on my old phone. I actually got a message, I gotta change my phone because it's so old, it's gonna quit working this month, this December. But uh, so, how many things can come into these phones nowadays? Countless things, probably. We have access to so much stuff on these phones. A lot of it, really good stuff. A lot of it, I'm not sure. And a lot of it, really bad stuff. And everything in between. And boy, if, if you haven't researched and stuff about the media and movies and all this stuff, and they, the United States even had this, this uh, um thing they passed a long time ago to actually use, it was a program to use the media and all this stuff to shape society's views. And it was a powerful program. I wish I'd looked that up and, and put that on here. But, and it was very intentional. And then they supposedly, I don't know what year, they did away with it. And it's not, they're not doing that anymore. I don't know what you think about that. I got my thoughts. So the media to movies to everything we're getting inundated with is trying to shape us and direct us. And then you got the Lord. And he's wanting to be our shepherd. And he's wanting us to be led by him. And he's not going to force us. He's not going to knock you over the head with his, his staff and say, like my dad used to say a lot, knucklehead. He didn't say that to me a lot, but a lot of other things. So that, um, it makes me think of God's commandments because the Lord is my shepherd the other alternative that besides everything else trying to be our shepherd 
There's a quote that says, the greatest battle every man or woman will ever fight is a battle over self. We have a struggle of struggles going on constantly. We are constantly wanting to do what we want to do. One of the most famous Satanists, Lister Crowley, had a famous saying, do as thou wiltst. And boy, do you ever see that being talked and promoted through almost everything besides God? Do as thou wiltst. Where did that originally come from? I believe Satan himself. And he told the angels of heaven, and he got a whole one-third of them to side with him, and sure enough, they decided to try out that theory, do as thou wilt. But Exodus, um, it talks about, and if we go to, where's, that, where's those Ten Commandments found? Exodus what? 20. So Exodus 20, God gets pretty specific here. And it says here, and God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God. That right away takes us out of the picture. We're not God. My dad, that was in the Church of Scientology, uh, before he passed away, he was in that most of a lot of his life, most of his life. He shocked me one time when we were in a discussion, and we had lots of discussions and debates over all this. And one time he, I was talking about how you know what, because they have eight dynamics starting with the you dynamic or self dynamic and then family and friends and all this stuff and it grows bigger and bigger outside of your sphere of you. And then the eighth dynamic is the supreme being dynamic or the God dynamic. And Scientology basically says, you know, we don't go there. We leave that up to you. If you're a Seventh-day Adventist, or if you're a Baptist, or a Methodist, or a, a Buddhist, or a whatever you are, that's okay. We don't go there. That's up to you to decide and define, figure that out. Well, that's false. They do go there when you get in the higher ranks and everything. And it's just, and interestingly, L. Ron Hubbard, the founder of Scientology, got to be friends with Aleister Crowley. Hmm, and they did all kinds of satanic rituals together. And then L. Ron Hubbard got all that given to him of Scientology. It's interesting. Well, it starts off in the Ten Commandments, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or in earth beneath or that is in the waters under the earth. And thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord, thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquities of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generations of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that, what? Love me and keep my commandments. Mm. Makes me think of uh, my John... Uh, 14 and, and uh, Revelation 14, 12, and then the, at 1 7 says, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who take his name in vain. So the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. This is putting those first three commandments in perspective here. We're making l the Lord our God versus making us or anything else or anybody else our God. And we're asking the Lord to be our shepherd and him to lead us. And uh, Matthew, Matthew 6.32, let's run over there real quick. And uh, Matthew, and this is a pretty neat passages here where Matthew 6 
and verse 32 says, For after all these things do the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. And what were all these things? Eat and what you got to eat and drink and clothes and all that stuff. Your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. And verse 33 says, But seek ye first yourself? No, yeah, the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then all these things shall be added unto you. You know, I told my dad way back in the day, I said, you know, you got these eight dynamics, and the eight dynamics is that God dynamic or supreme being dynamic. You say you don't go there. You're going to focus on all these other eight dynamics or seven dynamics. To me, the way I understand life, according to God's word, is if we focus on that, your eighth one, if you focus on God, the creator, all those other things come into place as you focus on him. And then my dad said something I... It really took me back. And he goes, well, what do you think? Um, what if we had something to do with creating all this? I said, what do you mean? Well, what if, what if you and me are gods? And we are actually part of the creator of all this. I had a hard time even wrapping my head around that, let alone replying to that. The concepts of this. And people are just getting sold this. But boy, I love that where it says, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. The Lord is my shepherd. If we want to surrender our lives, and this is a moment by moment, not just a day by day, but this is a moment by moment basis surrendering our lives to him and letting him lead our lives. And then he can guide and direct us. And boy, I don't know about you, but I personally don't like to learn things the hard way. I don't. If you can prevent me from doing something wrong, tell me. Ah. I am so just, just humble dude, just trying to do the best I can. And if you got something that can help me out, tell me. Don't let me just, oh, watch this. <laughs> yeah, he's doing that wrong. Watch what happens when he does this. Don't stand back and do that. Help your brother. And so I, I love Jesus wants to be our shepherd he wants to help us and guide and direct us. But we got to be listening to him. And we're going to talk about how we listen to him. Verse 2 of uh, Psalms 23. He maketh me lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. Mm. Does God know what's best for us? He does. Do you ever think that you know what's best for you? I don't know about you guys, but I think I, oh, I got this. And how many times have I been humbled by my way wasn't the right way? And I'm just like, oh, Lord, I'm sorry. I just messed up again. Can you help me? And God is so good. He doesn't like say, mm, I'm going to let you flop around a little bit longer. I'm just going to let you go a little bit longer and and I don't think you really understand that you need me so I'll no God just wants to take us lead us and then help us find those green pastures those beautiful places and bring us to the, some water still waters not crazy stormy waters you know it makes me think about that fourth commandment really does God really have a Sabbath rest to his people still? 
I've had so many people challenge me on this, and, and I, I just, I want to see from God's word that God has changed his Sabbath day. And I haven't found it yet, but if you can show me, I am willing to see that. Show me from God's word. But that fourth commandment, remember the Sabbath day, keep it holy. He's asking us to rest. Why? He even says at the end of that, that commandment, why? Because he rested. Going back to creation, he rested from all his work. As an example to us, Psalms 23, he makes us lie down in green pastures. Do we need a break sometimes? We do. We'll burn ourselves right out. We got some farmers in the house today of God's, and boy, are they hard workers. You have no idea how, and I have no idea even, how hard farmers work. They are just working, 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 working. And do you guys need a break every once in a while? Oh, yeah. You know, God wants us to lie down in green pastures. He wants us to just take a break. And I believe that fourth commandment is one of those opportunities. And uh, so Matthew 6, 32 and 33 it, uh, we just read that again. It goes right back to that again, that if we're, we're seeking him, seek first the kingdom of God, he's saying he's going to take care of us, all of our needs, all of this. Going back up there, it says um, I, that, wherefore, uh, therefore take no thought, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewith all shall we be clothed? For all these things does a Gentile seek, for your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. Not only does he have, knows we need it, but he's going to lead us to all of that. It's a beautiful thing. Verse 3 says, he restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. He restoreth my soul. Have you ever felt like you've gone and wandered away from God? And just kind of, you know, I know what's right. I know what I should be doing. But you know what? I'm just, I'm not feeling it today. I'm just going to do my own thing today. And I can, and you do. And I don't know, sin seems enticing, and it just makes us want to do something that we know we shouldn't, but afterwards, it's like our soul. We can feel it in our soul. It wasn't right, and we feel bad for that. Psalms 23.3 says, He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Um, uh, any of you probably know that by heart. Um, uh, you can go there if you want real quick, but Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not unto your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will what? Direct your paths. Well, that's what a good shepherd does. He directs our paths. It's a beautiful thing. If we are truly surrendering our lives daily and moment by moment to Jesus to be our shepherd and to lead us, we don't have to worry anymore. We just have this opportunity to just be led by him. And then Psalms 119.11 threw that on there for you. Thy word, the psalmist said, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Getting God's word in there is so good. In that first John 1 Niner, if we mess up, and we do, don't let the enemy ever think that first John 1 9, you've used it up. Because you can't use it up. It's always there. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and even cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And then, we can then, once we're cleansed, ask him to put his robe of righteousness on us. 
And now don't let the enemy try to think, get you to think, oh, you don't deserve that robe of righteousness. Look at what you did. Think about what you've done. Just think about that. You don't deserve Jesus' robe of righteousness. Oh, but wait. Jesus is saying, it's free. Just take it. Just take it. I forgive you of those sins. And now once you've been forgiven of those sins, when the enemy or anybody in your life tries to remind you of the bad things that you've done, I want you to say, praise God. Not for the bad things he did, not for you doing bad, but praise God. Because you asked Jesus to forgive you, and did he? Is he faithful? Is he just to forgive us our sins? That's what 1 John 1, 9 says. Then he's already forgiven you of that and cleansed you from all unrighteousness. So when your people or anybody or even Satan himself tries to put thoughts in your mind saying, yeah, remember this? You don't deserve Jesus' righteousness. You don't deserve nothing. Say, well, yeah, that's true. Well, praise God. You just reminded me of that time that I sinned, but you also reminded me of God's grace because he already forgave me for that. That's in the past. It's forgiven. I've got Christ's robe. It's a beautiful opportunity we have. And uh, so Psalms 23, 4 says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Have you ever felt like you've been there? Oh, man. I've, I've had this come to my mind many, many times throughout my life. But it says, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. You know, I don't know what it's like to be a, a little lamb wandering around. But boy, if all of a sudden I'm wandering around as a little lamb and bad and all that stuff, and then all of a sudden I just come around the corner and I see a big bad wolf. And he's just barring his teeth and he's got dripping and he's just looking all nasty and he's wanting to lick his chops and he's saying, I got some lamb chops here today. And all of a sudden, I'm the little lamb. And I'm going to be like, I can try to bar my teeth. It's not going to look very fierce. And then all of a sudden, I'm going to get scared. And if I was a good little lamb, I would, all of a sudden, I'd be like, look back at my shepherd, and I'd go what? Bah! Boy, that's going to be crazy online. So, and sure enough, the shepherd, he'd hear me, and he'd be like, He'd look right over at me, and he'd see that big wolf. And then, do you think he'd take some action? Oh, man. Why? Because he loves me. He loves me. He loves me as a little lamb, and he wants to take care of me. And he's not going to let that big bad wolf get me. Mm-mm. No. And so he just goes over there, and he puts a whooping down on that thing. He scares that thing off. And then I guarantee he just grabs me. And just holds me because I'm a little lamb and I'm probably pretty trembling right then. This is the God that we serve. This is a picture he's trying to share with us. We can even walk through the valley of the shadow of death. But, I, a little pause for this. Don't be presumptuous and say, whoa, uh, that looks like a dangerous place. That's a dangerous path right there. Ooh, that looks rough and bumpy and scary. And I think I'll go on down there. Why would you go down there? I don't know. Looks kind of fun. I'm bored and I want some adventure. And I think I'll go on down there. But that's not good. You could get hurt. Yeah, God promises to be with me even through the valley of the shadow of death. Well, that's what the sign says, valley of the shadow of death. I know, let's go. Well, that's being presumptuous. But if you happen to find yourself in the valley of the shadow of death and you didn't realize you were going there and all of a sudden, well, don't worry. 
Because God's got a promise right here you can fall back on. Psalms 23, 4. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. As long as Jesus is with you, you don't have to fear anything. As long as Jesus is with you. Now, if you've kicked Jesus to the curb, and I know that sounds pretty blunt, but how many times when we look at our phone and we're entertained by something that we know we shouldn't be looking at, you're kicking Jesus to the curb. When you're tempted to do something you shouldn't do, or you say something you shouldn't say, or you're tempted to say that, and, you, and you, you're just going to do it anyways, you're kicking Jesus to the curb. Because he can't stay with you. When you're willfully going down sin and so but if jesus is with you you have we have nothing to fear thy rod and thy staff they comfort me hmm interesting matthew 8 23 and 27 i want to take you there real quick short sideline story let's go there matthew 8 23 love this story it's really short matthew 8 23 and the words of jesus we got to hear it right from him matthew 8 23, and, uh, and when uh, he was entered, when Jesus was entered into the ship, his disciples followed him, and behold, there arose a great tempest in the sea, insomuch that the ship was covered with the waves. <laughs> but where was Jesus? What was he doing? He was asleep. Wow. He was in the valley of the shadow of death, so to speak. Was he fearing? No, he was sleeping. He was not fearing so much. So, um, but he was asleep. Verse 25 says, And his disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us, we perish. And I guarantee in that moment, I can't wait to see the, the actual video of this scene right now. It is going to be crazy. We've read this and read this and read this probably. We've heard this story so many times. We have no idea how, how treacherously crazy, scared, and freaked out, and they were ready to literally die. They had done all in their entire power, I guarantee it, to bail and bail and bail and bail and do everything they could, and they were hardened, tough seamen that they, they knew how to do this and they'd weathered so many storms, but this one was different. Why was it different? I believe we're going to find out, but I believe God allowed this to happen to show them that you can, you can try all you want, even at the thing that you're the best at in this world, and sometimes it's not enough and you just need to rely. You need to learn that you've got a good shepherd that wants to take care of you. You've got Jesus. If Jesus is in your boat, you have nothing, nothing to fear. The biggest thing you need to fear, though, is if you've thrown Jesus overboard. And we do that again by willfully sinning and doing what we know we shouldn't do, and he's got to get out of our boat. And then... When the storms come and you don't have Jesus in your boat, I'd say you have good reason to fear. But these guys, they were scared to death, literally. They're just drenched in sweat. The waves are coming over, slapping them in the face. Man, it's just going crazier and crazier. And they're just like, oh, you know how that is when you're just, you have tried everything and it's not enough. And you're just like, oh, I don't have what it takes. And that's where they were. And then all of a sudden, oh, wait, Jesus, that's right, Jesus, where is he? He's sleeping. Well, wake him up. And they went, they woke him up, and Jesus, Jesus. And uh, um, let's see here, let me get back there. And uh, uh, but we perish. And he said unto them, what? Get this. Why are ye fearful, O ye of little faith? The first things out of his mouth was, Why are you fearful? 
You got me in your boat. What were you thinking? And then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. And I guarantee, I can't wait to see that moment in the video that's been recorded, right after Jesus stood up and rebuked that storm in the sea. And it went, I think the only sounds you're going to hear at that moment is water, drip, drip, from your face, from your hair, from your clothes, you're soaking wet, drip, 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 perfectly calm, and you're looking at Jesus standing up in your boat. And it says here, but the men marveled, saying, what manner of man is this? that even the winds and the sea obey him. Mm, I got goosebumps. If we have Jesus in our boat, we have nothing to fear. If we have Jesus as our shepherd and we're submitting to the good shepherd, we have nothing to fear. Even if we are walking, found walking in the shadow of death, Hebrews 12, 5 through 11, it talks about whom the Lord loveth, he actually chastens. So, if you are doing something wrong, accept God's correction. Actually, even though it's tough to get corrected, and little lambs sometimes need corrected, if you're getting corrected by God, let him correct you. Let him correct us. And even thank him for loving us. Because it says in that verse, he whom he loves, he chastens and corrects. 23 verse 5 says, Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemy. You know, it uh, makes me think of um, this book, um, this little one here by uh, Jim Cimbala, The Life God Blesses. I just read this story for worship last night about King Amaziah, 2 Chronicles 25. We don't have time to go through that. But this king, God had blessed him, and he had let God lead him. And wonderful things. He even got to the point where he was going to go against the enemy, and, and he had a bunch of people, but he thought he needed more armies, so he hired a bunch of armies from Israel, and God sent a prophet saying, I'm not with Israel. Send them home. And then he said, but, but what about the tons of silver that I just gave them to hire them to help me? And the prophet said, don't worry about that, basically. God can bless you with way more than that. You know, I really believe, you know, it talks about Psalms 23, 5 says, prepares a, thou prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Sometimes we can end up inviting the enemies to our table that God has prepared for us. And that's not a good thing. And the prophet said, God will not bless you. you can, if you keep them, God will not bless you and you will fail in this, this uh, war, this battle. You will fail. Even though you have way more men, troops, you're going to fail because God will not bless you. He cannot bless you because God is not with them. If you've got people in your life that are tearing you down, taking you down, it's, it's a dangerous thing. We can be witnesses to them as God leads, but having them as close friends and, and consoling with them and, and sharing our problems with these people that are not of God and not filled with him and his Holy Spirit, you're only going to get some not good things talked to us 
It's not good. So sure enough, the king went ahead, dismissed those, uh, that army, and they were mad, and he went into the battle, and sure enough, he ended up winning that victory, a great victory. But then it ends very sad. He ended up, this awesome king that trusted in God, ended up taking the idols and God's lower G from the enemy that he just stomped and set them up as his gods and he began to bow down and worship them. You've got to be kidding me. And the prophet came to him, what? You're bowing down and worshiping the gods of, of them that you just, those gods are the, the wimpy gods, basically. They, they couldn't save them. And now you're bowing down. Craziness. Thou preparest the table before me in the presence of my enemies. How many times do we invite the enemies to our table and we, we want to, to be in their presence, and we're asking God to still bless us. And uh, so that makes me think of that book, Don't Give the Enemy a Seat at Your Table by Louis Giglio. New book he's got out, and that um, I listened to that little interview of him. It made me think of this. And he goes at in depth of this. I haven't watched the whole series, and I haven't read the book, but I watched the first of his uh, portion of his series here and he's really talking about this on how God blesses us in so many ways but we got to be careful to not invite the enemy to our lives and our tables and the enemy can come in in so many ways nowadays like never before especially through our phones through our computers through your TVs through all these different means, we have got to stop inviting the enemy into our lives and into our homes. And I want to challenge us on this note. Be praying and asking God, is there anything in my home that is like one of these gods that Amaziah brought back have I brought anything in my life and in my home that is not honoring you, Lord? If there is, show me what that is and help me to get it out of my life and out of my home so that you can bless me. Mm. And uh, First Samuel um, I, talks about how uh, it, well, the second part of that verse says, Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. In 1 Samuel 16, it talks about David being anointed with oil and receives the Holy Spirit. This is essential for us. We have to have God's Holy Spirit leading our lives. Jesus went up. And he said, I have to go. And if I don't go, then the, the Holy Spirit won't come. So I have to go that the Holy Spirit may come and give you power. We need God's power to overcome all these temptations, all these things. And so um, in that same verses, it says that as David received the Holy Spirit, King Saul, the Holy Spirit, left him. So the Holy Spirit can actually leave you. We can't be grieving away the Holy Spirit. We need God's Holy Spirit in our lives. And Philippians 2.13 says, For it is God which worketh in you, to both to will and to, to do of his good pleasure. That's what we need. As we close, I just want to read you just uh, three quotes here about the Holy Spirit. And uh, this is from a compilation called Ye Shall Receive Power by Ellen White. And it says, Christ has promised the gift of the Holy Spirit to his church, and the promise belongs to us as much as to the first disciples. Mm. If you thought they were a little bit on the wild side, receiving tongues of fire like the Holy Spirit just landed on them, well, we're supposed to be receiving this. 
But like every other promise, it is given on conditions. There are many who believe and profess to claim the Lord's promise. They talk about Christ and the Holy Spirit, yet receive no benefit. They do not surrender the soul to be guided and controlled by divine agencies. We cannot use the Holy Spirit. The Spirit is to use us. Through the Spirit, God works in his people to will and to do of his good pleasure. But many will not submit to this. They want to manage themselves. This is why they do not receive the heavenly gift. Ouch! Only to those who wait humbly upon God, who watch for his guidance and grace, is the Spirit given. Mm. Who wait humbly upon God, who watch for his guidance and his grace, that's who the Spirit is given. The power of God awaits their demand and reception. Mm. How many times have you demanded and, and, and opened yourself up to receive God's Holy Spirit? This promised blessing, claimed by faith, brings all other blessings in his train. It is given according to the riches of the grace of Christ, and he is ready to supply every soul according to the capacity to receive. Mm. So the last psalm is number 6 in 23. It says, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Is that what you want? I want that. I want to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You know, 1 John 14, and this is the last, 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 last. 1 John 14, or, or just John 14, it says, um, let not your heart be troubled. First, or John 14, let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me, Jesus says. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Put your name there. I go, Jesus says, to prepare a place for you. Put your name there. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you, put your name there, unto myself, that where I am, there ye, put your name there, may be also. Oh, Heavenly Father. I want to praise you for this message. All through your scriptures, but Psalms 23, what a wonderful promises that you've given us. And you long as a good, good shepherd to lead us in the ways of righteousness, your ways of righteousness. And we're sorry for not wanting those so many times in our lives. We're sorry for asking you to step aside so many times. We're sorry for asking you to get out of our boat because we're taking this boat a different direction than what you want. We're so sorry for not wanting your righteousness, choosing rather filthy rags. Mm. Lord, please, once again, forgive our sins right here and right now. Cleanse us from all unrighteousness based on the merits of Jesus' blood that you willingly lay down your life for us. Thank you, Lord. We have so much to be thankful for. Thank you, thank you, thank you for all that you've done for us, all that you're doing for us, even this moment, behind the scenes. Thank you so much for what you're going to do for us. We just want to surrender our lives right here and right now again to you. Please, come into our lives. Be our good shepherd. Lead us, Lord, in your paths of righteousness. For your name's sake, I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.